Thank you, everyone. Uh, distinguished experts, speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to session eight of NICE International Conference on Understanding Nepal's Foreign Policy, uh, which is on emerging security challenges of Nepal. It's uh, one of the important sessions of the conference. Um, as I said, the chair of the session uh, has medical emergencies, so I'll be chairing this session. We have six speakers at the session. Uh, we would like to wrap up all our presentation in an hour and spend another 30 minutes on discussions. Hence, I'd like to request all the speakers to make the remarks in eight to 10 minutes. Uh, the first speaker for today is Major General Binoj Bashnath, who is a security expert. Uh, Major General Binoj Bashnath uh, is the Nepali Army, uh, is from the Nepali Army, and uh, is a strategic analyst on South Asia Affairs. He is highly decorated with the order of uh, Suprabal Jana Seva Sri of Nepal, order of the Lion of Finland, and the order of Cross of Germany. He holds master's of philosophy degree in defense and strategic studies with first class from University of Madras. He served in key leadership and management role, notably at, as brigadier commander, division commander, and deputy chief of staff. After his uh, uh, retirement from the Nepal army, he represented the United Nations Department of Political Affairs as a resource person for Sri Lanka transformational and rehabilitation <laughs> program. He He's highly uh, devoted uh, and is uh, involved in advising, writing, editing, and participating in intellectual capacities. He, li he likes strategic thinking. His focus is on geopolitical and national security issues. And he has been uh, researching on China and South Asia issues. So uh, Major General Binoj Bashnet, over to you, sir. And you have around 10 minutes. Right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dashwal. Nice for having me. And thank you for the kind introduction. It is indeed like uh, good to be back again with your team, as well as with the prominent speakers in this two days international webinar. And congratulations to Team NICE, as you administer and organize the efforts so well and professionally. So before I go into the specifics of my topic this morning on emerging security challenges in Nepal, I would like to highlight on the geopolitical environment in the late 1940s that guided formally shaping Nepal's foreign policy, international, regional, and security surroundings occupy a meaningfully as security environment trends and challenges have direct bearing on the foreign policy. So my presentation this morning will be divided into four parts. First is international, regional, and national security environment that impact the formulations of Nepal's foreign policy. Second, contemporary international and regional and uh, uh, national security environment assessment. Third would be ne Nepal's national security challenges. And I will end with a way forward. Uh, part one. So the end of the World War II in 1945 looked forward for maintaining international peace and security as an apparatus that would prevent war, promote social progress, better living standards, and human rights. And the world more dependable. United Nations and international organizations founded in 24th October 1945 was formed with the major stakeholders, five permanent members as accountable to global governance and 51 countries. So international finance uh, uh, financial organizations like the IMF, uh, the World Bank was formed in 1944. In uh, 1966, the ADB was formed. So multilateral and globalizations was the theme. Central was Europe. So colonial rules were culminated. Occupations of Tibet created as a buffer from South Asian nations. The Himalaya was a challenging boundary, but North was a communist and South was vibrant with influence of India. And the, and the Cold War had begun and ended with the Soviet splintered with original nationalism. So part two, international, regional and security na and national security assessment. Asia Pacific was renamed as Indo-Pacific regions and Indo-Pacific as the center now. Second, founding of the Build Back Better World in June 2021 by G7 
led to the US to address 40 trillion worth of infrastructure needed by developing countries by 2035, of focusing on connectivity, roads, bridges, airports, ports, power plants, climate, health, and health security, digital technology, and gender equity and equality. 2031, 2013 announced the Belt and Road Initiative, or One Belt, One Road, by President Xi Jinping. China is undertaking BRI that contains the six international economic corridors. So, and uh, fourth, China's political will of South Asia as a bridge to the Indian Oceans with several geopolitical theories, of which CPEC and the other is the Trans Himalayan Multi Dimensional Connectivity Network, and sometimes referred to as Trans Himalayan Network. It's a, let me uh, talk a little bit more on this. And the extra corridor between Nepal and China as part of China's Belt and Road. This was held by President Xi Jinping during his visit in Nepal in 2019 and changing Nepal from a landlocked to a landlocked country. So the corridor consists of several transportation infrastructure projects, the flagship infrastructure project in China Nepal Railway, which currently is at the stage of feasibility study. So the number of highways projects are to be implemented, including the constructions of a tunnel road upgrading the Arnigo Highway and ends at the border of the village of Kodadi and the Chinese border crossing Jiangmu. The border port is set for restorations under the initiative. So the projects also consists of internal improvements to Nepalese transport infrastructures, including service three months, uh, north-south corridors of the country, the Koshi economic corridor, the Gandaki economic corridor, and the Karnal economic corridor. So the intended projects include the Kathmandu Pokhara Lumbini extension of uh, China-Nepal railways and various highway projects in the Himalayan Valley. So this highlights the infrastructure development in Tibet and the probable impact. So the other one would be the BCIMEC, which I'm sure everyone, all the listeners are very aware of. And the other is the BCM China, Myanmar uh, uh, is another important for South Asia. And uh, the China, Myanmar economic corridor is an economic corridor planning to build calls for building roads and rail transportation from Yunnan province in China. So the Chinese high-speed rail network reaches Myanmar border. So the opening of the Chengdu Ruang Lin will further mainland Southeast Asia historic reorientation towards the north. Now the fifth would be the United States and China's competition with the value-based dimensions is also in roles as one of the core issues and the coming up uh, 9th of December, 9th, 10th December summit for democracies lead led by the US being attended by 110 countries, including Nepal is one instance. Next, confrontations with the border conflicts between China and India leading to militarization of the Himalaya. Seventh, establishment of Asia Infrastructure Development Bank in January 2016 by China for which the mission multilateral development to improve social and economic outcomes in the region, Asia and beyond. The bank has been approved by 86 members worldwide. Eighth, expansion of China's buffer along the Himalaya and Nepal is part of it. Nine, argument of India's security architecture in South Asia and the credibility of the first neighborhood policy. Tenth, India's vibrant strategic placing, largest democracy with 1.3 billion population, is uh, vital for the United States. The questions of ideology versus realism. In geopolitics, a lot are happening with the US saying from time to time that single greatest threat to the world is coming from the Communist Party of China. Another point, a strategic framework like the formation of AUKUS, a trilateral security pact between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, announced in September this year, and strengthening the Quad. So the US during the Cold War 
opposed wherever Soviets sought to make inroads and intervention acted. Would there be a military alliance? Now is the beginning of Cold War 2.0 interventions of China looks likely. Is South Asia, in South Asia, independence of Bangladesh in this, uh, uh, the beginning of 70s uh, and integrations of Sikkim into India. Now my third part, I would deal on into the emerging security challenges. So the region has also observed strategic shifts below the Himalaya, perceiving four key geopolitical and two political trends of Nepal. These trends uphold the security, diplomatic, economic, and political consequences. One, India and China's rapid growth in both economy and political influence in South Asia. Two, the strategic communications network north to south as part of the BRI projects will put up with strategic linkages, which will uphold the security, diplomatic, economic, and political consequences. Three, variety of transportation systems from air, land, rail to waterways, and last new approach for economic development through uh, mega projects and increase in the FDI. So the internal vibrance is nationalism in hand and extra regional and regional influences on national policies and traditional beliefs. And second, major alterations in the political system in Nepal to a secular federal and a republic with the initiations of the 12 point agreement between the SPA and the Maoist in New Delhi. So the greatest challenge to Nepal is one, political instability and corruption, while other challenges are diplomatic trust, three, politicalizations of institutions, four, unfocused priorities, five, system of governance, six, unprioritized security sector, seven, economic downturn, eight, social and political degradations leading to an argument of identity, nine, people's losing confidence on the political parties, and 10, environmental degradation. Uh, with the time constraints, so I will just deal with two or convene with two. One is the political instability and corruption. So the risk of regional polarization, the stability of foreign policy and political chaos creating an environment for working together post COVID-19 is a challenge and vulnerability to Nepal. Political forces, so a strategy to cope with the pandemic would need to harness resources from South Asians. Nepal is going through multiple crises from pandemic disease, political instability, misgovernance, and economic contradictions to systematic inequity and environmental degradation. So the interlinked challenges of sustainable development has not been clear. Nepal had a communist government that held almost two thirds after two decades, but fell and paved way for a coalition government with the rest of the political parties and split left parties with varied, varied ideologies. So when Oli was the prime minister, he meeting the chief of the raw came with controversy within and outside his party. While the meeting could have been also taken as a means to regenerate the strong Nepal-India bilateral ties. So as head of the government, the PM can engage as convenient for serving Nepal's national interests. When political talks were under siege, diplomacy was not moving forward. So Nepal cannot afford to play one nation to the other. So it will be both a strategic and diplomatic setback. So all we have to do is prepare for the worst eventualities to serve the people and the country. People cannot be held prisoners for mistakes of lack of strategic thoughts and decisions. There is an unlawful financial dealings and corruptions from the streets to the parliament in all sections of the governance, which all of the listeners, I'm sure, know about and not in need explanation. So the political instability and corruptions will provide a platform, a vacuum that leads to other happenings in and within the country that will question Nepal's identity, diplomatic trust, economic downfall, and confidence in the people. 
Second is the unprioritized security sector. So the altering geostrategic environment, trends of geopolitics and accessible Himalaya revealed that defense capabilities and law enforcement obligates to be beamed into. Indo-Pacific regions is primarily primacy comparatively. Ability is technology supported smart for an agile force that security sector should aim. China's new border law is being executed from January 2022, is aimed at the border management and administering with India. Policy in both policy is both smart in concept. The central sub-regions of the Himalaya arc where Nepal lies is vital for both our immediate neighbors. Nepal and South Asians have stiff choices to choose with the altering geopolitics. The risk of national security and challenges exists to transform Nepal army, both the police forces and the intelligence agencies. National security requires rearranging, revitalizing, reshaping defense and law enforcement forces. So the, my fourth last part is way forward. For the next five years, with the new mandate is crucial for Nepal's long-term stability and prosperity. The political parties must find common solutions to questions for the people to answer. Honorable Prime Minister Serbadu Dewa said the other day on the National Convention for UML that all the political forces requisite to be united to unravel emerging national security challenges. Nepal has two options for discourse in the upcoming decade. One, strengthen the security sector for redefined security architecture, including efficient defense ability with an argument of financial support. Or two, rummage for a political and diplomatic solutions or determination, an argument for foreign policy being performed, like the zone of peace proposal that King Birendra tabled for UN approval in 1975. So diplomacy is the core to fulfill Nepal's interests, like leading the intergovernmental organizations and multilateral institutions, like climate and environment, persuasions of effective functionings of SAC, BIM state. So Nepal and Nepal's national interests should come first. National interest must be the guiding policy for decision makers. So there has been a coordination mix up between strategic structures proceeding to unwarranted occurrences in the future. So the elections, the coming up elections should be an opportunity for the people to answer if they still desire the major alterations in Nepal's political system to federalism, secularism, republicism, so that the people will have a home homegrown system. So the national, the next is the national army should focus on national security, potential defense challenges to and redeploy, re-employ for securing the borders from all sides. So the instruments of power and the tools should redefine the responsibilities to be accountable, non-political and adopt measures for a corruption-free governance. Strategic organizations and national security must be prioritized with potentials and existing military bonds. Military diplomacy, that has been the backbone of national diplomacy relationships with India and our immediate neighbors. Understanding of India's security concerns and China's growing influence as China's political ambitions are making it more dependent on neighbors, uh, neighbors for strategic and transit needs. Nepal is no exception. So to conclude, Nepal's sovereignty must be well set and outlined from well protected borders as one, geography has changed, two, geopolitical situation is different, three, great powers rivalry is shifting in our part of the world, four, geopolitical compulsions are visible, and five, weak governance and corruption observed. So nationalism is service to Nepal's interest, protecting independence, sovereignty and integrity of Nepal, patriotism, 
is love and loyalty to Nepal. Playing China against India or vice versa or anti-China and anti-India or anti-America is not nationalism. It is merely politics of convenience and controversy. So I urge the Nepal's political elites, influential forces and heads of political organizations understand the geopolitical interests and policies so as to protect and prevent politics and economic constraints that could corner Nepal's means and ways to evolve our own interests. I will be more than happy now to discuss uh, further about this subject matter or more during the question and answer. Thank you for having me again, Nice, and uh, 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 thank you. Over to you, Pramod. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. Thank you, Ms. and Binoz Bashnit, for the comprehensive remark. You have touched upon all the major aspects, and we have received a few questions, um, but uh, we'll share it in a while. So may I now invite Dr. Arpita Giri, researcher, NICE, uh, and she'll be speaking on India-Nepal migration, a human security perspective. Dr. Arpita Giri has done MPhil and PhD in international studies from Jamia Mila Islamia, New Delhi. Her work mainly focuses on issues and challenges faced by women from the global south in the migration, okay. progress, migration process as a part of the diaspora. She has been actively participating in and contributing on to international and national conferences, workshop and training courses. At present, she's also associated with Asia and Global Affairs as a joint researcher. Dr. Giri, over to you. And you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Pramod, sir, for the wonderful opportunity presenting my views on India Nepal migration. So, uh, world over, the number of migrants has grown. And according to the latest data, around 3% of the total population are migrants. Migration has grown, so as the challenges faced by migrant workers. When we talk about uh, migrants, we see they are playing important role in the host country and home country. In host country, they are providing skills, skills and the labor, much needed labor to the economies of the countries of destination. Similarly, in the origin countries, they are uh, providing skills and uh, remittance to remittances. They are playing an important role in the development. However, the security challenges in, uh, faced by migrant workers are enormous. We have seen this uh, during the period of COVID-19, when millions of migrant workers were deprived of their, uh, their livelihood uh, and uh, thrown out of their country, uh, thrown out of their destination countries, and in many cases not accepted by origin countries. So this is how migrant workers uh, around the globe are fa uh, facing security challenges. When we talk about uh, India-Nepal uh, migration, we see there's a historical linkages between Nepal and India uh, started with the migration of Gurkhas in British Army and movement from the areas of Nepal to north northern part of India, uh, which has continued even in the post-independence period with the uh, Treaty of Peace and Friendship. Uh, this allowed free movement of people and migrants. We have seen that migrants from uh, migration from Nepal has uh, diversified in uh, towards the 1970s uh, to the Gulf countries. However, the migration is still predominantly towards India. So we see. Arpita, like, can you slightly move your camera down because we can only see the ceiling? Yes. Am, am I visible Perfect. now? Yes, thank you. Okay. So uh, looking at the profile of India Nepal migrant worker, there's a study conducted by Nepal Institute of Development Studies. And um, this is the only data where we'll get the actual profile of. Uh, Nepali migrant to India, it shows that uh, most migrants originate from Western development region. And in terms of uh, higher percentage among migrants from Midwestern region and far Western region, these regions have little industrialization and have lowest human indices. Most migrants who come to India use remittances for daily consumption. This shows that even among the, uh, the group of migrants, the lower level of socioeconomic uh, strata of people goes to India and the people who have resources they go to Gulf country and then who have more resources they go to, they go to the developed developed countries. So, so the challenges uh, uh, the challenges imposed on uh, secure for the security of migrant workers we see in the origin countries there are enormous challenges. For example trafficking. Trafficking is the uh, 
system with here migration from nepal uh, it is like there are group there are uh, there are there are people there are organization who are involved in human trafficking which are uh, uh, which are like growing with the globalization and political economic challenges faced by by the people so along with uh, the trafficking there are issues of irregular migration we don't call nepali migrant india migrant illegal they are mostly irregular so what i uh, would like to argue here is that we need to work on data we need to work civil society should play an important role in protecting the rights of nepali migrant workers in india and indian migrant workers in nepal which we have seen during the covid 19 when supreme court of nepal ordered that nepal should also focus on uh, uh, nepali migrant workers who are working in india that's all thank you Uh, thank you, Arpita. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Now, may I now to invite Amit Kumar Singh, center from Central University of Jharkhand. Uh, he will be speaking on Nepal-India relations from security perspective. And Amit Kumar Singh uh, is a student at Politics and International Relations, Central University of Jharkhand, Rachi. He has completed his MPhil in Development and Peace Studies from Mahatma Gandhi Antarashtriya Hindi Vishwavidyalaya Varda, Maharashtra, India, and also completed his undergraduate and postgraduate from Banaras Hindu University, Baranas, India. Uh, over to you, Amit. Thank you, sir. You also have ten minutes. Topic is uh, India Nepal relations from security perspective. Uh, this is my uh, uh, bit of introduction. Border security, trade security, cooperation on the military security, climate security, human security, and migration issues. And these are the uh, paper's conclusion. Push India to military relations with South Asia, the peace and trade security of 2015. Military collaboration since 1952. Surkha recruitment from Nepal. Newer project better on <coughs> employment of foreign. When the Amit, we can't see your slide. We can only see your screen. <coughs> can you please click on a slide or open the slide? Uh, it's visible, sir. Uh, please speak little louder and open your slide. We cannot see your slide. We can only see a list of documents, but not a slide. Uh, sir, is it visible? Uh, no, it's not visible. Let me let me stop, and you can start again. Please start your slide again. You can only see number of PDFs, but. I think you select the wrong uh, options. First, you open the slide, and then select the slide that you want to show on the screen. Uh, this is visible now. No. Uh, let me stop. What you can do is like first open the slide, and then press green button, and then choose the slide. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Please go ahead. Please carry on. Most enduring military relations with South Asia, the peace and trade security of 2015, military collaboration since 1952, Gurkha recruitment from Nepal, newer project, and veto on employment of foreign. When the Nepali King suspended Parliament in spring 2005, India imposed an arms embargo. The government in New Delhi <coughs> meditated between the monarchs. The Demo Democratic Party and Mo and Moise, which led to the peace agreement in 2006, in July 2013, India lifted the arms embargo and restarted the joint military exercise with the Nepali government. Next, uh, border security. Border security on May 8, 2021, India Defence Minister Virtually inaugurated. A new 80-kilometer long road in the Himalayas connected to the border with China at the Lipulekpa. The Nepali government protested immediately 
<coughs> containing the road cross territory that is claimed and captivity in the obtaining the status without diplomatic consultation. And this is related to the two thousand Nepali citizen are employed as active duty soldier in the Indian Army and further one million Nepali migrant uh, workers are believed to be spread throughout India where <coughs> while Indian embassy in Nepal has reported that six thousand 60,000 Indian citizens in Nepal had registered their paperwork with the Indian Embassy in Kathmandu as of 2021. India and Nepal is working on development of cross-border trade infrastructure and ways to boost trade and <coughs> investment, including the creation of cross-border economic zone. India has been investing significantly in border infrastructure in its neighborhood, including roads, railways, and waterways. In a bid to increase connectivity and reduce, revive old linkage, and in, in Nepal, 73% of India total development assistance goes into building infrastructure projects. Trade support. India and Nepal have conveniently shared intense trade and commercial ties, and as neighbors in the South Asia region, when Nepal are, Nepal was confronted with chronic political frustration that led to the emergence of various trade barriers, India continued to be Nepal's constant trade partner. India has been affected significantly from its neighbor foreign policy, for example, for neighborhood policy. Trade between India and Nepal is demonstrated by the bilateral trade treaty signed in year 1971. Amendment in the year 1991-1993-96-2002-2009 by which both of the nations provided tariff and other duty adjustments on essential and produce commodity imports and export from both sides. Cooperation on the infrastructure. Recently, the requirement, uh, requirement of the Nepali army for various defense tariffs was also deliberated upon the meeting of the 40th Nepal Bilateral Consultative Group on Security, Ministry of Defense. Future security concern, training and capacity building, requirement of defense forces of Nepal and bilateral cooperation in disaster management were some of the key issues relating to the future security. Climate security. What is the political <coughs> issue in India and remains an important diplomatic concern due to flood and Agrarian difficulties, India and Nepal relations are interlinked with water sales agreement and distribution. Um, excuse me, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt, but your voice is not audible. So, can you please speak a bit louder? Water is a political issue in India and remains an important diplomatic concern due to flood and agrarian difficulties. India and Nepal's relations interlinked with the water sharing agreement and disputes. The countries signed COSI and conduct agreements to reach India's rising water demands. While there have been signed agreement between Nepal and India, no project except the COSI barrage, uh, COSI barrage has been completed at, for example, Bihar flood. Nepal and India share an open water, but the relationship is at its lowest due to water issue. The Kalapani is a major dispute area between both sides. In November 2019, the government of India released a new edition of the Indian political map, which included the disputed region of Kalapani within India's border. Chinese simulated growth is metaphorizing Nepal and establishing important con contemporary institution for a vast bilateral nation formula project and the Diversification of geopolitical in, in connection, uh, interconnection covering the Himal states. Nepal being a landlocked country which located between India and China. Project between India and Nepal. The Indo Nepal by, <coughs> Battalion level joint military exercise, Surya Kiran, is conducted alternately in India and in Nepal. The 14th Surya Kiran exercise was held from 3 to 16th. December 2019 at Sahaljadi, Nepal. Currently, 36 intermediate and large projects such as 
कंस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ ए नेशनल पुलिस एकेडमी एट दनौती नेपाल भारत मैत्री पशुपति धर्मशाला एट तेलंगाना ए पॉलिटेक्निक पॉलिटेक्निक एट हेथुडा एंड द नेशनल ट्रामा सेंटर एट काठमांडू आर एट वेरियस स्टेज ऑफ इम्प्लीमेंशन वाटर रिसोर्स कॉपरेशन एनर्जी कॉपरेशन एजुकेशन कॉपरेशन ह्यूमन सिक्योरिटी एंड माइग्रेशन इशू द माइग्रेशन इशू इज ए क्रिटिकल एस्पेक्ट बिटवीन नेपाल एंड इंडिया माइग्रेशन एंड सिक्योरिटी एव ए कॉम्प्लेक्स रिलेशन एंड इन सी एस एल रिसर्च ऑन लिंकेज कॉन्क्रीट एंड मोस्टली ऑन एनर्जी एंड एसेसिंग द रेंज ऑफ पॉसिबल सिक्योरिटी थ्रेट द गुड प्रोसेस फ्रॉम माइग्रेशन नेपाली स्पीकिंग इंडियंस हैव ग्रेजुअली बिकम एसरेटिव नॉट ओनली इन द टर्म्स ऑफ एसेटिंग द एथेनिक आइडेंटिटी बट आल्सो इन पॉलिटिकल टर्म्स द गोरखा नेशन लिबरेशन फ्रंट ऑफ सुहास किसी कंसंट्रेटेड इन द दार्जिलिंग हिल्स एरिया डिमांडेड इन द 1980 ए सेपरेट गोरखा होमलैंड विद इन द इंडिया federation the history of migration from nepal of nepal to india makes it appropriate to the pattern nature and direction have been differently maybe due to their historical background geographical variance ethno religious efficiency bilateral agreement and political system problem arise when the migration is illegal and poses multi layered threat to the indian state and the end of the past <coughs> paper conclusion thus we need to improve our mutual cooperation with nepal to prevent the illegal activity against india we can achieve this by sincerely resolving our differences and using our, our bilateral strength sincerely for example our historic and deep root rooted people to people contact commonly referred to as the roti beti garisa also we must take full advantage of the strong military ties between the two countries In the in the context, we need to recognize and honor the retired Gurkha soldier of the Indian Army in Nepal as our ambassador and use their influence to better our mutual relation. We must honestly addressing facing dispute such as the 1950 treaty, trade and transit treaty, boundary issue, and our agreement. We need assure Nepal that India needs support in all happening to become a vibrant nation and help region. its glory we must remember that a vibrant indo nepal relationship will lead to a better security cooperation between the two countries which will be very helpful in dealing with the concern thank you uh, thank you thank you amit kumar uh, may i now invite manmeer kaur manmeer kaur is a researcher at nice and she is an economics undergraduate student from hansraj college university of delhi and is currently pursuing her post graduate diploma in security studies from university of mumbai she is the founder of giri up visa a human empowerment initiative in her hometown she was the indian ambassador to european student think tank and the chairperson of international legal council global youth for the year 2021 and her research primarily include geoeconomics defense and security studies in the indo pacific and india europe union european union relations so manmeet over to you uh, so am i audible yes okay uh, so um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be uh, you know to speak at this conference and um, be a guest speaker here at the panel um and i uh, i sincerely thanks to all my fellow speakers who have given such nice input on uh, this very important important topic but i would like to hear here like switch the focus of the conversation a bit i feel more or less we have throughout the session we have more or less talked mainly and primarily through the lens of uh, traditional security approaches and uh, i feel non traditional approaches are some are equally important when we study any foreign policy so i would be focusing on four uh, non traditional approaches towards security studies uh, which affect nepal today uh first one is economic security second is climate security third being food security and fourth being terrorism and insurgency so uh to begin with in a very layman's term non traditional approach to security study mainly highlights the shift in focus away from 
military power being the core determinant of international order and security and focusing on a very domestic issues and understanding how they you know sort of uh, harm the harm the otherwise safeguarded citizens of a country so the first part of my presentation is economic security so um, in the pandemic which has seriously seriously affected economies across the globe caused a 3.3% contra uh, contraction to the world economy whereas nepal suffered a contraction of 2.2% in the fiscal year 2019 and 20 which was even severer than at the time of earthquakes of 2014 15 um according to the recent estimates by the world bank nepal's growth is expected to be driven by uh, the service industry uh, as in and the social distancing eases up and by agriculture on the back of recent uh, favorable monsoons um however the ex the expected effects of pandemic are known to be you know having a uh, lasting effect so what required is a readjusted uh, readjusted approach to covid-19 Uh, what we need to do is the tourism market needs to be backed up with ecological tourism uh, principles enhanced infrastructure and uh, tourism diversification otherwise the sector may not recover fully and as we know tourism is one of the most important sectors uh, contributing to the gdp in nepal uh, the country's low economic growth rate unequal distribution of productive assets and income and limited social security coverage means that the citizens are even more vulnerable now also at the same time the increasing number of unemployment and even the returning migrants from um, india bangladesh and other countries uh, may and has severely affected the progress that poverty reduction measures made in the previous years uh, moving on to the climate climate security so nepal is a himalayan country which is heavily reliant on um, diminishing glacier water supply and has a population of 83% living in rural areas so this puts nepal in a in a very sensitive environmental zone um at the same time we cannot forget that high vulnerability of people along with a lo uh, lack of strong institutional system has put nepal on a, on even a higher likelihood of threatening human security so um i feel that there is an inadequate understanding of national security in government agencies uh, because climate change is still viewed exclusively through the lens of environmental degradation and natural disasters however in the in the recent times there has been acceptance that you know that climate change is a national security non traditional uh, national security threat so uh, nepal being home to uh, to the great mountain ranges and even mount everest the warming of himalayas increases at greater uh, elevations so what what is interesting to note here that emissions by the country are negligible uh, but it is still of still one of the most severely affected nations due to flash floods and earthquakes also um, climate induced natural disasters have put nepal's military installments and assets at a risk um furthermore the movement of security time security forces in times of conflict could be hampered due to the uh, national uh, disasters induced by the climate change so what the experts have argued that the national army should ensure a weather resilience uh, program and prepare for deployment during climate change indu induced disasters also to mitigate these uh, threats what is required is a good uh, environmental governance um, international support for good environmental governance successful resource uh, resource conflict management redefining the current paradigms of incorporating environmental peace into national security plans adaptive social learning and following the example of international standards and sustainable development discourses as recommended by the un um so that was for climate security coming on to food security uh, again nepal is culturally and geographically very diverse hence food security and subsistence is a by product of both ecological belt and culture uh, food insecurity prevails around 12% as per 2017 estimates in uh, rural areas and is prevalent in remote areas where productivity is less and the agriculture is being fed one interesting fact to note here again as i mentioned earlier that nepal is a negligible contributor to the world emissions but is still one of the most highly vulnerable uh, countries in the world when it comes to climate change so it is ranked fourth under the climate uh, vulnerability vulnerability index uh, so it is not easier for the country to jump out, jump out of this condition mainly due to the tough to topographic barriers and low infrastructural sufficiency so uh, 
Uh, furthermore, families that are battling malnutrition are entrapped in a vicious cycle of poverty. So climate change not only affects agricultural production and availability of food in Nepal, but also simultaneously creates a negative impact on access to the food uh, because it reduces their purchasing power and hence pushes them further into the whirlpool of this food insecurity and malnutrition. Um, the, the, this insecurity is intensified not only by domestic factors, but also external factors such as the interest of developing countries uh, in developed countries into the developing nations in terms of use of resource investment and trade regulation. So it is often observed that the donors uh, who provide financial assistance lay a multitude of conditions before providing such sort of assistance. So it's not only the domestic factors that uh, aggravate the situation, it is uh, international pressure that further worsens the situation. Um, there are a few measures that have the that that the collaborative efforts and as well as uh, the Nepal, Nepalese government has taken to ensure food security. So first is government of Nepal closely works with US government the, uh, the future initiative to increase agricultural productivity and to overall ensure that nutritious food is, uh, the consumption of nutritious food is improved and uh, productions are enhanced. Um, one thing is that the, uh, the, the constitution very recently acknowledged that right to food is a fundamental right and the act was the act right to food was passed only in 2018 so um, i think the, uh, the the realization came a bit late hence the situation got aggravated um more, one more effort which have, which which is an international collaboration is the world for food program and Nep uh, and the collaboration of world for food program and nepal food corporation which provides uh, food aid to the people in Nepal, especially uh, in the times of natural disasters. So despite the efforts, there is still a lack of foreign di direct investment in agricultural research and lack of development of marginal crops, which um, have worsened the conditions of food security and has led to inaccessibility in various regions. Um, coming on to the last part of my presentation, it is on terrorism and insurgency. So uh, again, uh, the dynamic is as such that Nepal is not uh, very heavily uh, affected due to international terrorism. It's, it's, it's basically uh, a transit point for a lot of terrorists from South Asia. And the situation can even worsen uh, due to the alarming situation and, uh, and the recent dynamics in Afghanistan. So uh, the very recent Nepal's official statement at the UNGA's meeting on measures at eliminating terrorism states, and I quote, the growing frustration, mistrust, and tensions have created an environment conducive to terrorism, making counter-terrorism more challenging than, than ever. So Nepal's geostrategic relevance is, it's, it's a landlocked state between two fastest developing giants, and the relevance kind of exceeds the size of the nation. Uh, the political unrest in the Terai region make Nepal, uh, uh, make Nepal all the more volatile to security threats. Um, as I mentioned, the country is not very affected by international terrorism, but it is a transit point for these actors. And uh, the government is cognizant of this fact that Nepal can be a target of like a soft target or a transit point or even a hideout for uh, international terrorists. Um, so the country uh, is in uh, so the government the government uh, highlighted a group uh, in 2001 uh, and target and labeled them as ter uh, terrorism and it was then when the fight against national terrorism began so it uh, before 2001 the country wasn't really uh, proactive in combating terrorism it was only after 2001 when the legislation was passed and it acknowledged its um, its presence in counter terrorism so Nepal is a party to seven different international counter-terrorism instruments. However, uh, there are no active groups or government programs to reintegrate former terrorists, which is, uh, it is the, I think it, it, it is the onus of the government to reintegrate uh, former criminals who have, you know, transformed and uh, are in a better space now to, re to reintegrate them back into society so that they can have a better chance at uh, living as a normal human. Also, the Department of Money Laundering Investigations needs to be a little more stricter and better monitor the sources of big money. Um, also, due to the political uncertainty, regional conflicts, and presence of terrorist, terrorist groups like the Maoists, Nepal is already on a high likelihood of being a terrorist hideout, which I previously mentioned, for groups not only across, across South Asia, but other uh, countries as well. 
but with the recent developments in afghanistan the situation has become even more alarming so these are the four uh, main non traditional security trends and sets that i wanted to focus on during my presentation so in the conclusion i would like to say that with the ever changing geopolitical dynamics and security trends it is as important uh, to safeguard humans and citizens from a non traditional security perspective as it is for the traditional security threat so um traditional and non traditional approaches can't go uh, very differently they have to go in hand in hand so that's that's it um thank you so much Uh, thank you so much, Manmeet. Um, uh, I think we will, we don't have the other two speakers, so I'd like to thank all our four speakers for their wonderful presentation. We have received lots of questions on Zoom chat, Facebook Live, and Twitter. So let me go through that. I'll let me start with the first question, which is for General Binod Roshnet. Sir, can you please describe the importance of Tibet in vision, great power nations, and Nepal's one-China policy? <clears throat> thank you, Pramod, and thank you, Niranjan. I just saw in the chat box uh, for the um, uh, for the question. Now, put it in a bigger perspective. Let us look at the whole uh, the Himalayan arc from east to west, like from uh, the Karakoram Range to the uh, Burmese uh, uh, to Myanmar borders. So, so three provinces are very sensitive to China. One is Xinjiang, the other is Tibet, and Hunan province. And like I brought out in the uh, presentation, the geopolitical theories of China lie on all three sides. Okay, on the east, center, and the west of the Himalayas. So now focusing on the center is the Tibet and uh, Nepal, which flows into the uh it flows into india so one strategically the united states and china's competition a rivalry the second is india and china's i mean very visible border confrontation which happened after 45 years no peace uh, i mean uh, organizations were set so, and if you remember, I mean, if you talk about this, this is where uh, Nepal's uh, placement is strategically important because Tibet lies there. Now, if you look at the 19, late 40s, when Tibet was an annexed, China had to consolidate Tibet as a you could take Tibet as a buffer for China, for China, for a consolidation. But now, when you look at China looking into South Asia as a buffer, now Nepal, we must realize that India had Nepal as a buffer to the north. Now, China will have Nepal as a buffer to the south. So, preventing activities in Nepal through India or with India, US's interest would be a major focus for China. And this is where Tibet comes in. An example could be the 1974, the Kampa operation, the disarming of the Kampas in 1974. So when we talk about the Nepal being the buffer or the five states along the Himalayas border in China being the buffer states, there are certain, uh, uh, I mean, events, political, economy, military events that will have bearing on being a buffer. So for Nepal, Nepal has to play a neutral role or non-aligned role so that we do not get bogged down, but we take the advantage of being strategically positioned. I hope that answers uh, uh, Niranjan's question. And back to you, Pramod. Uh, thank you, sir. There's one question to all the participants. like. Uh, Nepal is a mountainous country and it lies between two largest polluters, India and China. How vulnerable is Nepal when it comes to climate change and what steps has Nepal taken or can take to mitigate climate risk? Maybe we can start with the second speaker and then we'll come back to General Vinod Vashnath. So, Arpita? Yes, Arpita, would you like to comment?
Shall we, shall we move to Amit Kumar Singh and then come to our people? Amit, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, did you get the question? Uh, Amit, there's a question uh, which is asked to all the speakers. Uh, first, and that is Nepal is a mountainous country and it lies between two largest polluters, India and China. How vulnerable is Nepal when it comes to climate security and what steps has Nepal taken or can take to mitigate climate risk? Amit? Uh, sir, uh, Himalayan nature uh, is most important for Nepal because uh, very natural resources are there so that's why uh, every uh, 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 Nepal uh, uh, Himalayan region is very important uh, for uh, Nepal and uh, it's a very impactful uh, region for South Asia. Uh, Manmin, would you like to add anything to it? Um, yes, sir. So thank you for the question, whoever asked this. So I think, um, uh, very recently was the fact very acknowledged that climate security is indeed a national threat to the uh, to the country um the, i think the realization came a bit late but at last uh, something is better than nothing so it did came so that was the first step that acknowledging that climate change exists and that it needs to be looked through a security perspective and not just uh, a, a, from an environmental um Lens because when we view things from a more serious perspective as like non-traditional approach to security studies, the emphasis automatically changes. The ethos of the irrelevance of the um, of the concept changes. Um, as for uh, what measures can be taken, is the fact that uh, one um, one would be better environmental governance. So environmental governance is a is 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 a fact that when you may frame for policies for any policy for the better betterment of the country you keep uh, you keep environment as one of the central figures while uh, determining what needs to be done ahead so one aspect i think would be keeping uh, the keeping environment at the ethos of every policy that is being uh, made um, and other things could be like, uh, there was this principle when I was researching for my own presentation, I came across this principle called adaptive social learning. So there are various uh, international models that are being recommended um, that have already been followed. So analyzing where the loopholes lie in the current strategy and adapting international best practices could be one of the solutions because uh, Nepal has a very different uh, geographical uh, location than any other country in the world. Uh, so, identifying where the loopholes lie in the current strategy and incorporating international best practices, I think, could be um, one of the ways to mitigate the climate risk. So, I think these two points from my end. Thank you, Manmin. Uh, let me move to the other question. And if there is other people they want to comment later, the, uh, comment on these questions will come back. Um, before that, uh, the Binus person would like to comment on it. Okay, on the um... Climate change. I mean, um, the one one of the fundamentals is the United States coming back into the Paris Agreement. One. Second is the just happened the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference in uh, uh, Glasgow. And um, so when we talk about climate security, we are talking about the oceans and the mountains. So we are talking uh, mountains in Nepal and oceans in the coastlines of India. So it is, a, I mean, and, and though we have commitments in our intergovernmental organization, whether it is BIMSTEC, whether it is SARC, about improving the climate because of um, certain, I mean, economic ambitions of uh, nation states, I mean, these are not really well looked into as it should be. And the ones who are going to suffer are the Nepalese first? I mean, any layman can look from the hills of the in the hills towards the mountains, look north, and see the snow. Why doesn't it snow anymore? 
So what is happening in the mid hills of Nepal is leading to shortfalls of rain in the mountains, which is naturally deficient of, uh, um, um, I mean, creating snow, which impacts water. So when we are talking about the shortage of water in the 1940s, I mean, 50s, and water as the main challenge of fresh water. Now, if we do not have the organ, this is where, like if you look at the other side, this is where Nepal's diplomacy has to come in. Nepal as a small state must take a lead and get the other powers into uh, such issues like uh, climate change. So, uh, I mean, uh, so Nepal being actively involved in the BIMSTEC would be a good way forward uh, for addressing the climate change and finding a common answer for all the states in the BIMSTEC. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. There's another question uh, asked to Arpita. Arpita, are you there? Uh, which is on migration. Arpita, can you hear me? Or maybe other can also respond. Like after the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, there is outflux of migra migrants in South Asia. Uh, how critical is this issue for South Asia in general and Nepal in particular? How is it going to impact Nepal and how can Nepal prepare to deal with it? So anyone would like to respond? Arpita, uh, yeah, can I? Um, yes, sir. Pramuji, uh, can I? Um, okay. Now, withdraw, United States troops withdrawal from Afghanistan was not a new phenomenon. It was a peace talks and bilateral talks going on between the Taliban and the United States with mediators from years ago. So this was nothing to be surprised about. But the impacts that would have with the Taliban rule and the flow of refugees or the flow of, um, of acts of uh, terrorism or were of concerns. So South Asia, I mean, with the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan means that till stability is gone, till Taliban really reorganizes the states to Afghanistan, the flow of refugees is going to be around. At the same time, the questions of Afghanistan being sheltered for ter acts of terrorism and a place for preparations of terrorism acts. So, and if you look at this, I mean, all the South Asian nations have will be impacted somehow or the other. For instance, Nepal, and we've been reading in the papers that yeah, there has been uh, Afghani refugees who've come in. And as a signatory, Nepal is obliged and should also be accountable um, um, as a, a nation of the state to shelter certain refugees. But the important thing is the administrative managing and focusing on how, where, what could be done to help them return back to their countries, to help them get what they need, to help them be placed well. So this is important. So this is where this, the unfocused security thing that I brought out in my presentation comes in again. Are the agencies in, involved, whether it is the intelligence agencies, whether it is the law enforcement forces who are involved directly or indirectly on the refugees really know what is exactly happening in the country and what are the political obligations that needs to be done so that they are well looked after in Nepal at the same time they are they safely returned back to their country. So this is where it comes in. So my uh, urge is that the uh, agencies involved must be accountable on uh, Nepal uh, fulfilling the international obligations at the same time looking into uh, the migrations not being a security challenge in the future. 
thank you, sir. So we have got lots of questions for you, which is basically on security treasuries issues. Uh, I'll raise them one by one. Like Nepal has border dispute with India, and there are some media report of China's encroachment at Humla. Uh, how vulnerable is Nepal between world's two largest militaries and nuclear powers of Asia? Okay, let me take this question. All right. Um... I mean, the border issues has come up as uh, issues of uh, contested country. And I do not deny that there is a foreign influence on uh, the political uh, leaders to being uh, able to, I mean, being, uh, raising this issue about the border, I mean, about border. But more, as I brought out again, like, Tibet is a very, uh, is a very sensitive, both politically and security-wise, for China. So raising border issues brings about confrontations between Nepal, India, confrontations between Nepal, China. So what Nepal must be cautious about is one: Nepal must know that borders of Nepal, whether it is north, east, south, or west will be more vulnerable in the future. That's why I've been bringing out the issue about having a separate border security force. That's why I have been raising the issue, writing issues about uh, the military being focused on defense matters. That's why I have been, been focusing on non-politicalizations of law enforcement forces and intelligence agencies focusing on their responsibilities, not the political, not political uh, um, interest. So this is where things come on. So, I mean, Nepal must be, I mean, the security agencies must be clear on securing our borders, which may be of vital importance for both China and India when it comes to their interest being, uh, I mean, contested within Nepal. So once again, and let me repeat, we need a separate border security force. We need to realign the security forces with the trends of geopolitics that I have been bringing about in the future. We must get the tools and the instruments of power in line with what is going to happen in the future. Then we will be meeting the challenges and normalizing the situations where we will start benefiting. Thank you. So there are many questions, uh, basically related with border as well, which I'll raise later. But there's one question like, who are the key official stakeholders in Nepal for addressing the traditional threats and what are their role? That is one. And second is, how feasible are the prospects of cooperative security alliance in South Asia uh, in dealing with the border security? Now, okay. The um, um, later one first. Um, now, this is the age of where we collaborate on common challenges. This is the age when we have to be together to address common threats, common vulnerabilities, like we discussed, whether it is climate, whether it is terrorism, whether it is traditional threats, whether it is non-traditional threats. So, Nepal must be part of the bigger uh, security architecture. And the bigger countries must recognize the smaller states' security concerns, especially when the Indo-Pacific is the primacy, especially when South Asia is important, especially when a Nepal lie in the central subregion of the Himalaya is uh, vibrant. Uh, so what I would suggest on this is Nepal must actively participate in intergovernmental organizations, security collaborations. And I would suggest like if Nepal's chief of the army could be part of the Indo-Pacific conference, why couldn't South Asians have a chief of the army's conference so that we in the defense forces or the people in the 
the responsible in the defense forces, I mean, combined to uh, defeat common challenges. One, we do have uh, the law enforcement agencies collaborations and in meetings, but it is to a limit. We must be able to find a, a, a bigger platform. And like, for example, let me talk about the, um, the military not being a part of the BIMSTEC military exercises. That is one example where we try to isolate ourselves. What was wrong in Nepalese army being a part of the BIMSTEC military exercises that other participated? We would have learned more. Or the BIMSTEC military exercises was followed by the chief's BIMSTEC uh, conference. If we, if the political, if the politics did not, or the, uh, the uh, diplomacy did not allow military participant under the uh, BIMSTEC flagship, the chief could have participated in the chief's conference. So what I would suggest is let us not stay in isolation. Let us be part of the bigger team. Let us um, work for the interests of Nepal. Let us understand the geopolitical happenings so that Nepal can address and even lead through diplomat diplomatic um, um, endeavors for a better and secure uh, Nepal. Uh, so you just mentioned about Indo-Pacific. So let me raise that question first, that how do you look at China-US competition impacting the security of the country, Nepal? Uh, what are the implications of Quad, the UK, US, or Indo-Pacific strategy on a small country like Nepal, which is between China and India that stands on two different poles? Okay, on, on, on the issue, I mean, Indo-Pacific strategy and the Indo-Pacific regions, or whether we talk about AKU, Quad, other multinational organizations that are happening, it is basically, I mean, um, um, about 70, 70, 80% of it is focused in the maritime area, okay? Now, if we were talking about the 20% on the continental. So the Indo-Pacific strategy or the 14 countries that surround China, I mean, Indo-Pacific strategy is uh, one of uh, the, um, I mean, platforms for addressing the interests of the United States and the interests of China. So the 14 countries that surround, that border China are vulnerable. And at the same time, the South Asian countries, the five nations bordering the Himalayas, bordering China, is also uh, um, sensitive. So what I mean, um, but um, in Nepal, like uh, when I talked about politicalization of institutions in my, in my presentation, I was talking about politicalization of development. I was talking about politicalization of judiciary. I was talking about politicalization of defense forces. I was talking about politicalizations of law enforcement forces, politicalizations of inter I mean, intelligence agencies. So these are all things that we have to revisit and fail and, and I mean, uh, and your mark where politics comes in and where professionalism plays. Okay, this is how we will start answering the bigger question. We have to be right to take in lead because Nepal's foreign policy, Nepal's political act cannot withstand playing one nation with the other. For example, the MCC. MCC literally is politicalization of development. The process of MCC was not, in my assessment, done well. The loud mouths of the political arena jeopardized the political trust, jeopardized the uh, diplomatic behavior. Because it, if Nepal does not agree with MCC, there is a political process of going. But politicalizing it, bringing, to, bringing it to the people, and bringing it to, to the relations between the American and the, and the Nepalese population was not correct. 
So there has to be a mechanism of how um, politics is done for the country, not politics for politicians or individuals themselves. So this is another challenge also. And the other example is BRI. Yes, we signed the BRI, but comp I mean, there is no reason to politicalize between BRI and NCC. It is a matter of how we develop our countries, what are the benefits that we take from the development projects so that the economy of Nepal benefits, so that people are employed, so that the resources is capitalized, so that the resources is sold to other countries so that the economy rises. So these are the fundamental questions rather than, than taking MCC, BRI, or other projects from other international donors uh, being particularized. So we must differentiate between what we want, what we need, and politicalizing what we want and what we need. Yeah. Sir, you just mentioned about BRI and MCC, and we have got one question on that. Uh, but the other question that, but let me put that question first before going to others. Like, there is a question that do you think that MCC has, <coughs> sorry, do you think that MCC has security angle? Western scholars also mention about security dimensions of China's built a door initiative. So how do you look at MCC and BRI from security perspective? Yeah, you have already mentioned some of that, but if you want to add to it. Yeah, let, let, let me add. I think these are, these are things that we should really be clear about when talking about uh, the uh, national security and regional security. I, I brought out the issue about the trends of geopolitics, the north-south corridors. I brought out the issue about BRI having three uh, north-south strategic connectivity. So, so these are things that will need to be opinated so that we address the issue, we address the security ramifications for both China and India, as we lie at the center. So addressing this issue means redeploying, redefining ourselves, redefine. I mean, like, um, let me talk, let me, let me just touch upon the, um, the redeployment that the, uh, uh, the Nepalese army took um, um, just, I mean, I, I think a few months ago on geographic grounds, okay? Now, the infrastructure development north of our borders never existed before. It was a remote area. It was an area of challenge. It was a, an accessible area, but it is no more. It is now very accessible. And the strategic networks that lead from north to south is happening. And the political interests, the political will is determined. So this is where we have to, our tools, our instruments must be uh, put in place so that we address our issues, our concerns is to have a stable Nepal. And how? Our politicians have to be clear. The political forces must unite to address national interests. One. Second, is our foreign policy still uh, um, contested with the changes of the time? Is our organizations that operate to fulfill the uh, obligations of the, go of the you know, kind of government, eligible. So these are issues where we should be able to focus so that we see the, we see the future, but we address it with the apparatus that we have. The strategic organizations of Nepal, there is a big vacuum. Now, what that vacuum is, we have the head of the government, we have the head of the state, and the working and the governance system is under the head of the government, which relies completely on the ministries and departments, who are also part of the politicalization process. So the professionalizations, the professionals are not leading the country. 
the professionals are put back. The bureaucrats who are politicalized is running the country. So the strategic, the, I mean, um, the, the strategic structures must be formed so that they address the different issues. Like example, security. Now the chief of the, the, the chief of the army staff is an overall personality in Nepal who looks into or who is responsible today for the national security of Nepal. Though we have national security uh, secretariat, national security is, but the whole sole responsibility is the chief of this army staff who has to look into his organization who have, or you or she, maybe we might have she tomorrow, who have to look into their own management, their own internal governments, and who has to look into the national obligations. So the shortage of the other point is the shortage of the strategic organizations that the nation requires. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there's one question on climate change. Uh, we're running out of time, but let me take two last questions. One is on climate change, which even other uh, participants can answer. Like, despite contributing only 0.027% of the total global emissions, countries like Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Maldives are paying a huge cost of climate change. What can Nepal do to effectively voice their vulnerabilities in the international community? What should uh, the actual interest of vulnerable countries like Nepal be in relation to climate change? That is uh, one question. And last is, maybe I can ask later. So let me first go with this and then I'll come back to other. Uh, maybe you can go for it and then we'll see okay. who has to comment. As I brought out earlier, you know, climate is a very important and the way is, I, as I brought for Nepal, diplomacy. Diplomacy is the key to, and this climate and environment, climate security and environment is such a great field that everyone needs. This is where Nepal as a small nation must take the lead. And to start with, BIMSTEC would be a great platform that Nepal could uh, um, uh, initiate for climate change. So that other issues of climate change from mountains to the oceans, I mean, and, and at the same time, this will be a platform where other issues, why should we only be uh, the prisoners of the decisions that other big nations make? Because a climate doesn't have borders, but as nations, we have borders. So uh, this is where uh, Nepal's diplomacy should come in and Nepal should lead in places, in uh, issues where there are no borders. Thank you, sir. Uh, Manmin, would you like to add, or uh, Amit Kumar, or Pita, would you like to respond to any of the other questions or this question on climate change before we wrap up? Okay, so let me put the last question uh, and then we'll end the conversation. Uh, to uh, Mrs. Janabino's Basnet. One is that, uh, what are some current and planned connectivity initiative in South Asia region that could impact border security challenge in South Asia, including Nepal? So- Okay, uh, lovely, the nice, nice question. I mean, which I have been answering in the, in the first half of the question and answer is uh, for Nepal, as a, um, I mean, out of the six uh, North-South corridors, Three are vibrant, which are broader. The Koshi, Karnali, it's Koshi, Gandak, and the Karnali. So why these strategic networks are coming in? This is where the security apparatus should start foreseeing of the completion of the highway, and I mean of the network. At the same time, the forces deployments and the forces uh, um, and the forces uh, capabilities should be looked into to address. The defense forces cannot just sit down at the south, I mean, the south of the hill, I mean, the south of the uh, mid hills and look into the north. 
looking into the north means i mean addressing south's problem looking into the south means addressing north's problem so this is why i what i want to stress once again that the army must focus on defense an agile force that looks into the uh, um, as the himalay is getting so militarized so that the central sub region the nepal lies is looked after by nepal so that we have the political and security trust from both our immediate neighbors one so the it's not that's the military so when we talk about the other uh, threats we are talking about other law enforcement forces and intelligence unit who should look into all these issues so that right policies are put in place uh, so i mean uh, the trends of geopolitics once again the trends of geopolitics is there because of very tough traffic conditions we can't just wait for the train to come to kathmandu what are the consequences security consequences once the train comes what are the consequences if you look at the past history china nepal war i mean there were the chinese forces that came into rasua trisuli okay and when the strategic networks are done they will come uh, i mean uh, uh, through uh, for i mean jeeps you see, through the technology so this is where our tools and instruments of the security apparatus must address so that both our immediate neighbors are comfortable with their rivalry in the other side in the eastern side and the western side of nepal and two vulnerable places are one kalapani second olangchungula on the east so these are two very strategically uh, vulnerable uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, places and uh, districts for nepal china india security relationship Thank you, sir. I would like to thank all our speakers of this important session: Major General Binoj Bhushner, Dr. Arpita Giri, Amit Kumar Singh, and Manmin Kaur for their wonderful presentation. It was really interesting discussion, and we would like to thank each of the participants for raising an important question to our speakers. We'd we'd also like to request you to join our next session, which is called Diplomats Conclave. So please stay tuned. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Pamuchi, and thank you, Team Nice, for having me. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.